is a unit on low rank approximation of data and it's the first of three units on what I like to think of as linear stuff that's singular value decomposition principal component analysis eigen thingies that is to say any kind of data analysis that people dress up by using the word eigen in front of it and all that kind of stuff and we'll see that it's basically all one unified piece. We start with what's called a data matrix, also called a design matrix. To see what this is, let's use gene expression data as an example. Here we have the results of doing many experiments on each of 500 genes. So the genes, which are the data points, go down the rows of this matrix. And for each gene, we're going to do 300 separate experiments. These are done in some massively parallel way, perhaps, to give a vector of 300 results. And each gene's results form one row in this matrix. Now, I've plotted this in a color scale with positive values red and negative values blue. Typically, you wouldn't be able to see this kind of clumpy stuff because the genes are ordered in just some random order and the experiments are also random in their order. And therefore, if I shuffled those orders, I would just get a fine-grained mess of blue and red dots. And that would be the typical case for a data matrix. So as I've said, the n rows are the data points. Here, genes numbered 1 through 500 and the M columns are the so-called responses. And we can view each response as being a vector in an M-dimensional space. Here it's a 300-dimensional space because there are 300 components measurements associated with each gene. In this picture, for the actual gene expression data, each column is a separate microarray experiment under some different condition for example, in a knockout organism or in the presence of some drug. But that needn't concern us here. We might as well always assume that the individual experiments, that would be the columns of the data matrix, have zero mean. And the reason we can assume this is we can, after all, always subtract the mean from the experiments and, if we care to at a later stage, add it back in. It's also convenient to completely, quote, standardize, quote, the data. And that means that we'll also scale each column, multiplying it by a constant after we subtract the mean, so that it has a unit standard deviation. Furthermore, for what we're going to do, because it's going to be involving linear algebra, it's good to eliminate any extreme outliers in the data, because they would pull off the solution. Linear algebra usually is optimal in the case that errors are Gaussian. We've seen this before. Gaussians have tails that fall off rapidly, so if your tails don't fall off rapidly, it's a good idea to eliminate extreme outliers. Anyway, here's a piece of MATLAB code that shows you that I'm doing just what I say. I load that yeast array expression data from somewhere. I clip it at percentile values 1 and 99. I guess the clip is actually done right here. Um, and then I standardize the data. Also, I won't go through it. There's this little bit of arcane MATLAB color map stuff, which if you ever are in the position of needing to plot things on a blue to white to red scale, you can just copy this little piece of code in here. This is how the red, green, and blue intensities vary in a blue to white to red plot. OK, that's just nerdy details. Let's get back to the main point. The main point is singular value decomposition. Any matrix X, like our data matrix, but any other matrix, and it doesn't have to be square, any matrix X can be decomposed more or less uniquely into three matrices that have this form. U is a matrix that's the same shape of X as indicated here, and it has columns that are orthonormal. That is to say, the dot product of 
the, any column with itself is 1, and the dot product of any column with any other column is 0. And these columns, therefore, form a orthonormal basis for the space spanned by the columns of x. The second matrix in a singular value decomposition is a diagonal matrix, so it really isn't a matrix at all, except in the way we multiply it through. It really has only uh, m values, which are these diagonal components that are called the singular values of the matrix X. And it's always square, of course, because it's diagonal. And finally, we have a matrix V, which is also square in the case shown here. And the columns of V, now this is actually V transpose, so that would be the rows of V transpose. The rows of V transpose are also orthonormal and are an orthonormal basis for an m-dimensional space. Now, I've said that this decomposition is more or less unique. I'm not going to try to prove that in all detail, but let's just count the number of degrees of freedom, that is to say the number of independent parameters on the left side and on the right side, and see that they come out the same so that it has a chance of working out to be unique. And the theorem is that up to some technical points, it basically is. So in the X matrix, if we have N rows and M columns, then we have MN total components. Now what are the number of independent components in an orthonormal matrix like this? Well, the matrix has MN components, but it has a bunch of orthonormality conditions, that is to say, conditions satisfied by every choice of a row and another row, and we want to see what the dot product is. And the number of these conditions is m times m plus 1 over 2. Where did that come from? You're used to seeing the number of ways to choose 2 from m. That would be m times m minus 1 over 2. But then we also have the conditions that each row by itself is normalized, has dot product with itself of 1, and so that adds back in m additional conditions, and the total is m times m plus 1 over 2. Okay, here the number of parameters is just the number of diagonal elements, so that's m. And here we get another one of these orthogonal matrices, even though this one is square. So its number of degrees of freedom is m squared, and then minus, as before, m times m plus 1 over 2. Well, if you add up the right-hand side and do a tiny bit of algebra, you'll see that it exactly equals the left-hand side. Singular value decomposition can be done very efficiently. There's a well-developed linear algebra algorithm for it. It has about the same workload as inverting a matrix. That is to say, for a square matrix, it would be of order n cubed. I guess for this shaped matrix, it's of order m squared times n. But almost never do you have to look into the details of the algorithm. MATLAB, Python, and many other available sources, including numerical recipes, have ready-to-use implementations. So the singular value decomposition was x equals matrix U times diagonal S times matrix V transpose. And I can write that instead of by matrix multiplications, I can pull out the middle sums over the singular values here explicitly. And when I do that, each column of U, which I'm going to designate U dot I, dot is just to show you that it's a column index on the I, and each column of V, V dot I, get folded together into a rank 1 matrix, the outer product of these two vectors. So another way of explaining what singular value decomposition is, is it's a decomposition into a sum of rank 1 matrices, each one formed from two vectors. And if we arrange the singular values, SI, from the one of largest magnitude to the one of smallest magnitude, then we're adding smaller and smaller corrections to what's basically an approximation scheme for the matrix X. 
Now this turns out, in fact, to be the optimal decomposition of x into rank 1 matrices. It's optimal in the sense that the partial sums in this sum converge in the greediest possible way to finally have the total sum equal x, and it's the greediest in L2 norm. That is to say, at each stage, if we go for the first five terms in this sum, there's no better set of five rank one matrices that approximate x. I won't exactly prove that for you, but let me indicate why it might be the case. Um, we're interested in explaining all of the power in x in the sense of the sum over i and j of the square of its elements, because that's the L2 norm magnitude of the matrix x. Now, this expression can be written in this funny way as the trace of x times x transpose. If you've never seen that before, it'll become clear if we just write it out. Um, x times x transpose over here. Here are the components of x summed over the inner index j components of x transpose. Okay, um, And then the trace just says there's a remaining free index of i, and we should sum over that. And if you look at this for just a second, you'll see that the jith component of x transpose I could have just as well written as the ijth component of x, so this would be the square of the ijth component of x, and then this is just the sum over i and j of the squares of those elements. But the reason for writing it out in this trace notation is we can do a little bit of trickery on it. x is decomposed as us v transpose by singular value decomposition. x transpose well, the transpose of a product of vectors is the reverse of the transpose of each vector. So maybe I'll read it from the right. U transpose S is its own transpose because it's diagonal. And V is the transpose of V transpose. Um, well, now what can I do? Well, V is an orthonormal ve uh, matrix. So V transpose times V is just the identity matrix. Then S times S is just the matrix, the diagonal matrix, whose elements are the square of s along the diagonal. Then I still have a u and u transpose here. But the trace of any product of matrices is invariant under any cyclic rotation of the things inside. So I can take this u and rotate it over to this side cyclically and put it here. Now I have a u transpose u u is an orthogonal matrix, so that's the identity matrix, and I get the trace of s squared. Well, the trace of x squared is just the sums of the elements along the diagonal of s squared. And if I have those arranged from biggest to smallest, you can see that starting with the biggest one, that's the greediest thing I can do. That grabs most of the L2 norm of x that I can grab in a single uh, in a single term, and then I grab the second largest, and so on. So that's how this turns out to be the optimal decomposition. I didn't quite prove it, but I've motivated it for you. In other words, this decomposition builds up the dimensionality of x, starting with the single most important rank 1 vector, that would span only one dimension, and then adding dimensions as we add terms in the sum. Now if the data actually lie on a lower dimensional surface than m, remember we have the case m is 300, the number of experiments that was done on each gene, if it's on a lower dimension, then at some point the singular values will just be 0. And we will have discovered that the data can be summarized as a smaller set of rank 1 matrices than we expected. This is true if the data is not just lower dimensional, but actually lies on a hyperplane that goes through the origin. If it's approximately lower dimensional, in other words, it's very thin in some dimensions, and approximately planar, and approximately goes through the origin, then what we would see is we would see that the singular values get very small, but don't become exactly zero. By the way, this need that it goes through the origin 
is why we subtracted the means originally and why that was absolutely a necessary step if you're going to do this kind of linear decomposition. Or in the general case, we could just truncate this sum after a number of terms of our choosing and see what the best lower rank approximation to x looks like. This can be useful for filtering out noise. We'll see this in just a couple of minutes because it could be that most of the signal is in the lower dimension pieces and that the high dimension pieces are just a kind of a wash with noise that we can thereby f filter out. And again, notice that this captures only a linear hyperplane view of the world. Uh, if there are more complicated functional relationships among the data that decrease its dimensionality but are not approximated by a plane through the origin, then these in general will not be identified or exploited by SVD or principal component analysis or any of the stuff we're talking about here. An example of that would be suppose that the data all lie on the surface of a sphere in some number of dimensions around the origin. So since they're on the surface of the sphere, that would result in a decrease in the dimensionality by one because they all occur at the same radius. But since that doesn't go through the origin, since it's uniform around the origin, that would in no way be seen or captured by singular value decomposition. So let's go back to our original data set here and look what some of these lower rank approximations to the data would look like. Here's the original data set and now through the magic of PowerPoint I'm going to cross fade to the data set approximated by its first 20 singular values. I'll go back and forth between these so you can see what happens. You can see that a lot of the graininess is filtered out. And we might hope in many applications that that graininess stems from noise and that the pattern that we're seeing here is the actual signal that we're interested in. Now let me go even further and I'll cross fade to an approximation with only five singular values. And let's go back and forth between 20 and 5. Again, what we might be hoping for in our data analysis here is that most of the signal is captured in only five singular vectors even though there are 300 experiments. That would be a dimensional reduction that would make further data processing much, much easier and more efficient. Let's go back and look all the way from, from the original data down to 20 and down to 5. 